My name is Brittany Grant. I'm the Director of Business Development at The Hill. And I'd like to welcome you to this morning's event, Affordable Housing and the American Dream. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Wells Fargo, for underwriting this morning's program. For many Americans, particularly African Americans and Latinos, the process of buying a home presents more challenges than usual. Studies show that the rates of minority home ownership continue to lag significantly behind those of their white counterparts. What can be done to combat the racial inequalities that continue to pervade the home buying process? What policies can leaders in Washington and those in the private sector put in place to help ensure that every American can have an equal chance of owning a home, a long considered central pillar of the American dream? This morning during National Home Ownership Month, we will be joined by a panel, a pair of congressional leaders on these issues as well as a panel of thought leaders in the housing space. We will also hear from Dr. Ben Carson, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development via a video interview to learn more about the administration's work to make housing more accessible and affordable for all Americans, regardless of their background or zip code. But before we kick things off, a few housekeeping notes. In addition to our audience here in the museum, we are live streaming on thehill.com as well as the Hill's Facebook page. So please keep your phones on silent throughout the program, but we encourage you to engage in the conversation on social media. You can do so by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, at The Hill Events, and join the conversation using the hashtag, hashtag The Hill F Housing. We will be taking questions from the audience during the program, so please be sure, sure to look out for members of our team with handheld mics. And finally, you will receive an electronic survey following the conclusion of today's event. At The Hill, we are always eager to hear how we can make our events more dynamic, so I encourage you to take a few moments to provide your feedback on today's program. So with all of that said, let's dive right in. It is my pleasure to welcome Congressman Emanuel Cleaver and Steve Stivers, co-chairs of the Congressional Public Housing Caucus, for a conversation on bipartisan efforts on Capitol Hill to make housing more affordable for minorities. Congressman Stivers, a Republican representing Ohio's 15th Congressional District, currently serves on the Financial Services Committee. Throughout his four terms in the House, Congressman Stivers has focused on reforming our housing system and helping low-income families in their efforts to own a home. Congressman Cleaver, a Democrat representing Missouri's 5th Congressional District, has been a leading congressional advocate for federal affordable housing for minorities. Throughout his seven terms in the House, Congressman Cleaver serves on the Housing, Community Development, and Insurance Subcommittee of the Financial Services Committee. Joining the congressman on our stage is Steve Clemens, the Hill's editor at large. Steve, hey over to you. Good morning. Am I on? Yes, I'm on. Hey, hey, guys, how are you? Good to see you. Good, Good morning, Steve. Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> let me ask you, Steve, to Congressman Stivers, to start off, telling us whether you believe in the the notion that there is an affordability of housing crisis today. There is an affordability crisis and a supply crisis. Uh, so I live in Columbus, Ohio. How, what's the DEF CON level? Uh, it's pretty high. So I live in Columbus, Ohio. We just became a larger city than San Francisco. We have 50,000 units short in Columbus, Ohio today, and we have between 10 and 25,000 people moving in every year. Um, so we are, the crisis is bad and getting worse. And uh, for people that need workforce housing, right. affordable housing, uh, it's worse because the developers are building more expensive units, both multifamily and single family, but it's hard to build affordable housing because of lots of constraints, including some driven by our local communities. So I don't I'm mean anything yeah. facetious by this, but isn't that a sign of success? It's, it's good, except if you don't have access to housing, then it's a problem, and uh, we are, uh, we are victims of our success in some ways, but also the house, housing stock and the supply and home building has never rebounded from 2008. So, uh, you know, we are not building as much new stock as we used to. And in the affordable space, we need a lot of innovation. I just was uh, last week at the Innovative, Innovative Housing Showcase. Did anybody go to that on yeah, the Yeah, it was great. We were just it talking really about it. It was really cool. Did anybody see the tiny home? and? living in the opportunity to live in a shipping container, which didn't sound too exciting until I got inside it. And um, some of the manufactured housing that looked uh, really 
good, but it was really affordable. And uh, so I think there are some innovations going on that can help with it. Um, it's more than public housing. We need public housing. We need to make Section 8 more accessible to people. We also need to um, make it less of a hassle for building managers. So um, HUD needs to, I think, inventory their processes and say, gee, why are we having a problem getting people to sign up to right. supply Section 8 housing? Right. Uh, that's another issue. So there's a whole bunch yeah. of issues around this. And, and uh, the chairman and I, uh, these are bipartisan issues. The chairman and I agree on 90% well, we'll of what needs done. We'll get to where you disagree in a minute. But, yeah. But let me well, ask and, Chair. And yeah. I want to focus on where we agree. I know what you want to focus where on. We, that's where yeah. we'll get things done. But Chairman Cleaver, let me ask you. I mean, I, I, um, you recently won a distinguished award for your contributions uh, on the housing front, low-income housing, and trying to uh, erase the gap, if you will, between uh, what those of color and, and, their, and their housing assets like compared to uh, essentially the, the Caucasian white housing crowd. And, and I was very impressed with your comments. And, I, and I'd like you to share with the audience, why is this housing issue one that burns so hard for you? Well, <clears throat> I didn't live in a house with uh, indoor plumbing uh, or a, uh, electricity until I was almost eight. Uh, and I lived uh, 26 minutes from the Omni Hotel in downtown Dallas. Mm. That's, that's where I was born. <clears throat> and uh, finally, my father was able to get us out of there, and, uh, but we moved into public housing. And we stayed in public housing about five, almost six years. Uh, my father was able to, to buy a house in an area where they were going to build a shopping center. Uh, and that, so the house was moved to, the, uh, to an African-American community. Uh, and my father is, is in front of that house probably right now working in the yard uh, uh, <laughs> this, today. Um, but, um, it, it, you know, for me, it's, 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 it's not an intellectual issue. Uh, um, it's not even really a, that political. It's, a, it's an issue that many Americans face. And the, the, the strange thing that I... I, I that I'm having difficulty uh, getting across to people, and it is that rural America and urban America are so similar that there is absolutely no reason that there is not some kind of coalition. Hmm. Uh, if you, if you, t in my district, I, I represent uh, ha half my district is rural, and if you take the uh, the rural district, any, any any school in the rural district, they will have a higher percentage of people on the federal free lunch program than in the urban core. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's not dramatically different, but it's higher. And so I have a, let's take uh, uh, Marshall, Missouri. There hasn't been a new house built there going on 11 years. I, I said the same thing with Higginsville and, and Excelsior Springs and Richmond and Slater and Concordia and Odessa, uh, Oak, uh, Oak Grove. And so we have a, 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 a housing crisis I know I know uh, what it is to to have to to, to live in, in a, a decrepit uh, house, uh, albeit clean, but mm -hmm. it was all, nevertheless de decrepit, and uh, and and so I, I recognize the role that mu the the roles the various roles that must be played if we're going to ever eradicate uh, this problem. Affordable housing is, is it would be in my top three uh, domestic issues. One one of the, the most si significant and serious problems the country is facing. I had the privilege of interviewing Anthony Fox, former Secretary of, of, of Transportation, a number of times. And, and he was a former mayor and shared with me that there were several generations where the investments that we made in urban infrastructure, in freeways, essentially reinforced racism, bias, the bigotry of society. Uh, and it's very hard. And as we think about the world we want to be in five, ten years from now, we, we not only have to undo that, we have to redo it. And I guess my question to you is, in housing, um, how much of that bias is still part of the, wor the, the world of finance today, of opportunity, of way people are steered? Let me, let me start with you to sort of say, what do we have to pull out of the way to get rid of the discriminatory parts of our uh, housing ecosystem? Well, some of it is intentional. Uh, a great uh, deal of it is unintentional. Uh, when we built the freeways, we did we 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 uh, Split with great intentionality. Yeah, mm -hmm. we 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 destroyed neighborhoods. We we separated people, and people don't like to cross freeways. Right. And uh, a, a roads. Period. Uh, in 1965, Lyndon Johnson, uh, with this great idea, created a federal new federal department 
cabinet level called the Housing and Urban Development uh, uh, Department. And uh, the goal was to correct all of those problems that we had created. Uh, and and uh, How's HUD doing? I mean, we still have it. It's, it's, a, it's, still, it's, a, uh, it's still there. Uh, but, uh, but, but keep in mind, there are some things that have changed. For example, uh, we have a, we have a, 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 under President Reagan, uh, we, we created a, prob, a, a, a new policy that we would build no new, new public housing. And what people don't realize is that policy is still in existence. Mm. So we created what's called a one-for-one -one replacement, where you can only build a house, public housing unit uh, to replace a public housing unit. Like, for, for example, we did that in New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, and so we, we got, we're obviously just, my colleague is right, we, 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 you know, Section 8 certificates are down, but they're not going to be able to, to be, they'll never be sufficient because, uh, we, you know, right now we're, we're at, at a maximum in terms of the money uh, being spent on public housing because uh, we can't create any more housing to, and, and, and Congress wouldn't fund any more money to do it. We'd have to change the policy. Mm. Uh, we've got some serious problems, and some of them are, are almost intractable unless Congress does something um, revolutionary. Steve, you're, you're in, in this too, and I know that you, you care about housing and, and would love to hear why this is a burning issue for you as well. But to kind of come at it, one of the, I was at the, the mall uh, event, which the National Association of Home Builders put together with HUD and some other underwriters. And I was, I was blown away, but I realized when I was there that I guess the thing that hit me was we can talk about housing, and you guys uh, co-chair this caucus together and, and yep. whatever, but, but it, you can be um, the proverbial frog in the pot. You guys can be doing great things, but if the financial sector is undermining you, if other parts of the system are... Yep. So how do you get your head around the ecosystem of the things that have to be fixed? And, and, or am I wrong? Can, can I, the housing committee and can what you guys are doing, you know, sort of lead uh, in a way that forces these other jurisdictions to play along? Or do, think, you have a, do you have a frog in the pot I problem? think it is an ecosystem, but I think we can lead, and I think we can um, use our bully pulpit and other things um, you know, I think one of the problems, big problems in affordable housing is the finance system and the people who have not had access to credit, don't have credit, will never get credit because the way the credit scoring system works uh, and there's some new innovations that get people um, scores based on the things they already have like utility bills and cell phones and whether they pay those on time right. to start to build a credit score that today um, your traditional credit score doesn't count those things and so if you've never had credit you can never get credit which is um, problematic at so best you see for millions of Americans. So you see a tilt in the it's right direction. It's starting to move in the right direction but uh, those alternative scoring systems are still not mainstream yet and mm. so I think it's something that we have to, uh, it's one of the big things I think we have to work on. Mm -hmm. And we learned in 2006, seven and eight, not everybody is ready to buy a home and we shouldn't assume that everybody's ready. Joyce Beatty and I have a, a bill that'll be marked up this week. Uh, it's Joyce's bill and I'm a, a co-sponsor that will encourage anybody that's getting an FHA uh, underwritten loan to get um, credit counseling ahead and get home counseling, uh, sort of financial literacy training, uh, and then give them a discount for mm. that on their upfront cost of their FHA guarantee, which I think is uh, a good policy. It's, uh, it's something that will encourage people to be an informed homeowner, understand what they're getting into, which is really, really important. Um, so I think we've got a lot of work to do uh, to help people be ready, but we also have to make sure the ecosystem allows people to use it as a ramp. When the stairs are, you know, six feet tall, it's hard to climb a six foot stair. We need to make, make it a ramp or stairs that people can walk up so that we can allow people to improve their station in life. That's what I think we need to do to fix the housing finance system so that it's more inclusive for a lot of people. Mr. Chairman, if you were to move three needles in this, in this equation of home ownership, what, and, and whether they're in your jurisdiction or not, although everything's in your jurisdiction, you get to you know, do anything you want as a House member, I think. Uh, but, but beyond your committee, how, or in, in your committee, what are the three things you can do to move the needle on this topic so that we're celebrating uh, inclusive home ownership in this country rather than 
lamenting where we are? I think, first of all, I need about 42 more stivers. Um, and, and then I think we, that, I mean, I, and I'm not being uh, funny. I, I actually think we need some people who have fresh vision about housing and a, a fresh and clear, clear picture. Uh, number two, what, uh, this, this problem is not going to be resolved without multiple jurisdictional uh, cooperation. Uh, we, we, we've got to have the federal government involved, we've got to have the state government involved, and we've got to have the local government, federal government, uh, LIHTC. Uh, we've already mm -hmm. reduced the, the amount of money that could be used in low-income tax credits, I'm sorry. Uh, the tax bill actually reduced the number, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. the amount of money uh, that, that's going the to be The effectiveness of the rate, right? Because yes. the tax rate went down, so the leverage is less. Mm. And then we have the Housing Trust Fund, uh, which uh, comes out of uh, F, uh, the FHA, FSHA, Federal Housing, the, the parent company, uh, the parent entity for the GSEs, for Fannie and Freddie. Uh, th they take money out of that, cr and, it's, and it's divided around the country in, in, a, in what's called a housing trust fund. So we've got to have LIHTC, we have to ha have, to have the ha uh, housing trust fund. And frankly, we've got to put more money in the community development block grant program because uh, uh, as a former mayor, it, uh, the, it's the most flexible uh, amount of federal dollars you can get, and most of it will go for housing. Uh, and then we've got to deal with, uh, uh, with um, the, the whole gentrification issue. I'll tell you something very quickly. I, uh, two, two, one term before Charlie Rangel retired, I organized a group of people to go to New York to campaign f uh, for him. And so I uh, got early, up, uh, early in the morning, many, uh, a number of uh, members of Congress up there, we were walking all over Harlem. So I'm over uh, uh, talking to a group of guys sitting around, and I uh, introduced myself, and one of them actually knew my cousin, so I, was, I became important quickly. <laughs> uh, uh, he, uh, Eldridge, he, he, he was a former Black Panther, so he, he knew Eldridge. So we, were, we started off good friends. So I said, now, guys, we got to get up. Everybody's got to turn out and vote for Charlie Rangel. So this guy says, well, I'm not voting for him. Hmm. And I'm stunned. And I said, why? And he said, look at Harlem. And I said, it's looking good to me. And he said, that's what I'm talking about. He said, Bill Clinton's office is right down the street here. And he said, we can't afford to live here anymore. And he said, uh, uh, no, I'm not voting for Charlie Rangel, anybody. Uh, so, so, you go back to the point earlier, I mean, you, uh, uh, people are getting pushed out of communities, and, uh, and, and so they're, they're becoming angry at the prog what, what many would call progress. So what do you do to balance that? You know, the, the former mayor of Dallas who just stepped down, Mike Rawlings, uh, I used to talk to him about what his dashboard as a mayor was and and he went and you know actually he didn't have one the first time I interviewed him the second time he had a <laughs> electronic dashboard and one of the things he built in were real estate prices in South Dallas and he says I know I'm doing my job right when real estate prices in South Dallas are rising which means yeah. I'm creating demand I'm creating investment I'm getting people to, to come in more but that leads to the gentrification problem so, yes. so how do you solve both you know raising a community but then also looking at how you create uh, incumbent affordability mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we may have misdiagnosed the problem slightly. The chairman and I may disagree on this part, Finally. but I think the problem yeah. is is not gentrification. The problem is minority home ownership. Right. If you're a homeowner in a gentrifying neighborhood, you do well as the neighborhood gentrifies. The problem is because home ownership is so low in those areas, people get pushed out. If we can encourage and allow for home ownership in those areas, then as as neighborhoods get improved, the property values go up, and the homeowners who happen to live there get equity. That's mm. a great thing. That's the American dream. That's what we all believe in. So I think we may have misdiagnosed the problem slightly here, um, because gentrification is only bad when you don't own, the and main, you got to pay the rent. Chairman Cleaver, where do you most disagree with this guy? Well, uh, uh, with the Kansas City Chiefs versus uh, <laughs> uh, Cleveland, but. <laughs> But uh, but uh, I think uh, you know uh, what, what somebody, many of you probably have seen these uh, if you're in your hometowns. Uh, there are signs up: "We buy ugly houses." Right. Um, that's like step one for gentrification because you know somebody's living in a rundown house and somebody comes up and says, "I'll pay cash yeah, tomorrow," and they get the and they're gone. Well, they come in and and and, and rebuild that that house 
and that person who moved out or nor his cousin can, can move it. in it. That's right. And so uh, what, what we have to do is, and, and, and this, this is the, where we have to have municipal government involved uh, because they, they approve the licenses and so forth. Right. They've got to say, if you're going to build new housing uh, uh, anywhere in the urban core, and they can do it by zones, uh, uh, you've got to have a certain number of low to moderate income housing. You know, we'll give you a permit. You got 25 units, uh, you know, 5% or whatever uh, must be low to moderate income, and you can't go to the side. We did it in, in Kansas City uh, in a project uh, where uh, the, the builder didn't like it, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, it preserved the, the uh, original neighborhood. Well, the Hispanic neighborhood in Kansas City, gone. It's been there for 150 years, gone. Uh, big, beautiful homes are now all around there. Uh, and and, it's, and I hate even talking about it because it feels like I'm against progress. And I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm against, I'm, I'm, I'm for, you know, real inclusion. Yep. Uh, there, there, let me just ask you yep. guys real quick. And we got a few minutes. I want to make sure I get the audience um, to ask their questions. And I want to talk about community development block grants because I think uh, they can be part of the solution. You support them? I do support them 100%, but I think... So 25% to 35% of a home's cost, an affordable home's cost, is driven by the local community's zoning and building codes. Right. And they're written in such a way as to, um, you know, make it hard to do affordable housing. If we encourage communities through the formula of community development block right. grants to change their codes to allow for affordable housing, uh, I think you, they would do it and you'd see... A, re a reduction in cost of housing Where? because it, it drives a ton of the cost let's of housing. Let's go lightning around Along here. with uh, impact fees, let's go which lightning. are another problem. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go lightning around here yeah, real yeah. quick. There's there's a growing uh, clamor, and as best I can tell, it's in you know certain quadrants in both parties on uh, disposing of the mortgage interest dis deduction. Support or don't support? Uh, uh, preserving it? Yeah. Preserving uh, yeah. it or killing it? Oh, we've got to preserve it. Okay. I support for preserving you're it. You're preserving it. So you're there. And then and then on the issue of when I look at the um, price of housing today and you kind of look at the various dimensions, a lot of people think, well, it's, you know, your construction teams or whatever. It also is regulation. It's also the pr price of Canadian lumber. It's also water-related so regulations. And so yes. so I'm, I'm interested in, are you with the president on his trade agenda, which drives up a lot of the costs? No. Uh, Congressman Cleaver, are you with President Trump on his no. trade agenda? No. no. Okay, there we go. It's, you know, it's interesting. We just made news there, guys. Um, and, and I would also ask, one of the things that really interests me is whether we're talking about, you know, well, I love what you just said about preserving communities, and I, and I actually strongly agree with you. On the other hand, I always wor worry when we're doing these events, we're talking sort of about yesterday's issues in a way, what is housing, brick and mortar, but as we look at everything in the future, you know, part of it, you know, you see software companies that used to make widgets that are now saying we're a data company. And I'm wondering whether the future of the home is a different conception where the pipes, the infeeds, the kinds of things that you imagine what, what having a home means in 10 or 15 years is not a white picket fence. It may be uh, a, you know, a much more turbocharged version of broadband plus. And I'm interested in whether or not we need to redefine for a future what we're sculpting to get the home right as a concept that we're trying to get in. Because you go to Ohio, and I've done a lot of programs in Ohio, you know, the digital divide there is phenomenal. People don't understand that we do not have 25% of kids in, in Ohio, particularly in the Appalachian areas, do not have access, regular access at home to broadband. So are we negotiating and thinking about the wrong versions of what a home is? Congressman? Uh, well, yeah, I, th I think the, the, the 21st century home has to be dramatically different uh, because, yeah, I mean, we, I represent rural areas as well. They're right. also having the same problem. But in the urban core, you'll have people going, uh, young people who, who are serious students, going to McDonald's to do their homework. Because they, 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 have, don't, they don't have Wi-Fi. They, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to McDonald's or, or you know, any place they can, they can go. So, uh, you know, we, we've got to think 21st century. And it's, and it's difficult. I mean, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I didn't have to do it because I'm not a computer person, mm -hmm. not even... I just recognize them, but I, I uh, you know, you can't hardly graduate from high school now. Mm. Uh, you, you can't do your homework without uh, a computer, it's, and and that that would be one of the most significant thing, uh, 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 developments we can have, I, I think. 
21st century homes. Steve? So I don't think it's our job to um, figure out what the housing of the future looks like. That's up to the marketplace. Our job is to build a flexible network that works no matter what the future of housing is. And um, that, I think those are the kind of decisions we need to make is not exclude innovation mm -hmm. from housing. And I do want to clarify really quickly that I, on my trade answer, we do have to take on China, but trades need to be a means to an end and not an end among themselves. That's my concern. Fair clarification. And then final question for me, and I want to go to all of you. Um, in the 0809 financial crisis, one of the things that evolved, which I found to be um, myself personally abhorrent, was making the accusation that, that certain people got into home ownership that shouldn't have been there. They didn't understand it. They put the blame not on those doing credit default swaps as much as they did on people who were all of a sudden with underwater mortgages in, in this, and, and particularly communities of color. And so I'm interested as we talk about expanding home ownership and looking at this as a key asset uh, of wealth building in, in, in this country, um, Looking back on that, is there a better way to talk about expanding home ownership to, to communities that have not been uh, as representative and not fall into that trap again, where they get blamed for actually trying to pursue the American dream? Well, I, yeah, I was, uh, unfortunately I, and painfully, I was there from day one through that crisis on the committee. Uh, and we had uh, p uh, people coming in testifying, yes, we intentionally uh, directed our efforts toward black and brown communities. I mean, I mean, they confessed, and, and mm. we have it on record. I'm still angry nobody has gone to jail. Uh, I almost wrecked the world economy. I'm getting off now, but that still bothers me. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that uh, one of the things we, we have to do is to start looking at home ownership in, in a different way and recognize that everyone should not necessarily own a home. I, I, I agree with that. There's, I mean, uh, Herman Jr., my cousin, I, I wouldn't sell him a home. I, I wouldn't give him a home. We just made news again. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Herman. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it is. Thanks, Mr. Iris. Well, I think, uh, I, and I think it, it's misdirected to blame the people. We had a system. Does everybody know what a ninja loan is? No income, no job, no assets? Um, we had a system that allowed people to get loans when they couldn't verify they could pay them back. Right. And that's a system that was broken. And it was competing on less and less documentation, less and less underwriting. But you had a lot more. of people with jobs, with working so, all the time, uh, these still were, all of a sudden. So it was, yeah. you know, people yeah. buying more than they could afford. And it's not all, it wasn't all race. It wasn't all having to do with lower income. Mm. It went, it, so it was are you huge. confident that where system. we are now, they're not going to repeat that mistake? I, I feel confident that our mortgage finance system has been um, corrected on those, on those points. I think we still, I'd still love to see us uh, do some reform of the GSEs, but frankly, okay. there's no consensus of what to do. So I, I think Chairman Cleaver disagrees. Well, so yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I, um, I think it could, could easily happen again. Uh, because I, 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 there was, we, we did make some repairs. No, no question, we, we were able to do some things that stopped folk from doing that. But I, I'm not so sure that uh, the GSEs, I, I, you know, w they were bundling mortgages and selling them as securities that were worthless. And um, I, 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 I don't feel as comfortable as I would like to that, that, can't, that, that it can't happen again. And because the cause, the, the real cause of it was greed. No and I don't think we've stamped right. that out. Yeah. There was clearly not enough skin in the game of people yes. in the system that I sold somebody a mortgage and I took the fees and then I sent it off to some investor. I had no skin in the game whatsoever. Uh, that was a problem. We fixed it mostly, but there's, there may be more we need to do and we need to pay attention to it. Thank you both, Phil. Let me go to the audience. I'm going to stand for you because I promised somebody the first question. I can't, can't see her. So I'm looking. I'm trying to find you. But since I can't find you, I'm going to go here. Are you out there? Here we go. Yes. Hello. Um, I have a question about your redefinition, Representative Stivers, about um, the gentrification and home ownership. If uh, people don't have much of a wage, then if the prices are people going up, what? if people don't have much income, <clears throat> much income, me. got it. Right. Yeah, then how do they afford the rising prices? So the point is to get home ownership up 
in communities today before they gentrify, and then the whole point is then people will benefit from the communities as communities improve. And so we need to look at home ownership and try to figure out how to improve home ownership now in those communities. Uh, right up here in front. We got two in front. We'll go to both of you. Geneve, I know his name, so I'll, you know. <laughs> make, make it good, Geneve. Yeah. Uh, my name is Geneve. I'm with Thorner Partners. Uh, so my question is, can you weigh, on, um, weigh in on, on if companies like Amazon um, help further divide or help uh, um, kind of close that gap? And then also, should they be coming into urban areas, rural areas? Um, if you can weigh in on that Thank as well. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going I'm to edit you and, and say so you're talking about Amazon's investment of its headquarters too and the power. And let's go to this gentleman in the second row, Marissa, right here. Uh, but, but on the broad side of, you know, major investment of coming in where you've got major job creation, but we've seen, we're seeing right now uh, the very rapid rise of, of real estate prices in, in the areas around it. Is that fair, Ganeev? Yep. Yep. Uh, one of you. Uh, yeah. It, it can have massive impact. So Columbus made the list of the top 10 for the HQ2. Are you glad you didn't get I'm it? I'm kind of glad we didn't get it for a couple uh. reasons. It would have been a massive. So I already told you, we're 50,000 units short today. You add 100,000 jobs. Some people who would live in Columbus already, some people would come in. And our shortage would have been magnified immediately. We weren't ready for it. Uh, I'm not sure anybody's ready for that. But it's uh, those kind of airdrop big chunks of jobs right. are really significant changes and you have to be ready for them. We were also competing for Foxconn that went to Wisconsin and there were a ton of focus around workforce housing in that proposal for us. Are there any big investors in Columbus that you're glad you got? Oh, I'm glad we have everybody we okay. get. I, I, I want all our companies to do better. I yeah. want more companies come in, but, but a big company like that right. that would be the single biggest presence in town on day one. Right is a lot to drop, airdrop in, even to a community of almost a million people. Chairman right now. We, we, might need, we might need to go back to the future. And, uh, and, and that is, there was a time uh, after the turn of the century, major companies would come in, and then the housing would sprout up around the com company. And we have, there's a little town in my district called Sugar Creek. Uh, it's a Slavic community. Mm. And most of them worked at Armco Steel, which was located in Sugar Creek. And housing was built all around it. Uh, and I think that, that it, in, the, in the 21st century style, maybe we need to go back and do that, hmm. that if, if we're going to give some, as a former mayor, you're going to get tax abatement, look, you've you got to build a, a, a subdivision. And the subdivision has to be market rate and it, and it has to be uh, affordable. And, and I, I think we've got to do something that, that, might, that we've not done before. That w the government didn't require that. The companies did it because there was a closer relationship between worker and and, uh, We're going to go real here. fast. Last question of this gentleman. Hi, my name is Don Maxwell, and I appreciate you guys bringing affordable housing crisis up. But I'm a little perplexed because what's really high, and it's in some of you guys' areas, is uh, blight. And I'm seeing, like in Detroit, mm -hmm. there's 100,000 vacant properties, right. uh, 200,000 vacant apartment complex, which could help on Section 8. And it's all across the United States. So can you bring, what can you do to bring blight up as part of affordable housing? Fantastic as Cleveland question. is big, it's a, no, fantastic it's a big question. market. Thank You're you right. very much for being. So what do you do about the blight challenge? Well, I, go ahead, first of all, the, 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 it's not an easy solution. Uh, Parade Park, Kansas City, Missouri. First uh, housing uh, 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 project that, that was de uh, built in Kansas City, 200 empty units right now. So what, so what, what we need to do, same thing you need to do in D Detroit. You got to, if you don't uh, uh, start repairing it, it's going to wreck everything around it. Amen. But the problem is that the housing development appraises at 6.5 million and they're in debt 10 million. Now you show me a developer uh, who's going to come in for that project. So that's where I meant earlier, you got to have federal government coming in. Uh, you know, we used to have something called UDAG loans and, and, and HUD, Urban Development Action Grants. So, that you've got to have federal and state investment. If you don't, that, what I, 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 in and out of Chicago, uh, uh, Detroit, it's, not, it, it, it's just not going to be fixed. Blight has Steve. to be part of uh, affordable housing as we look at it. 
uh, because it discourages investment and opportunity in certain areas. And um, you know, some of these places are a little overwhelming, like Detroit has lost uh, 300,000 people. Um, and so that's one of the reasons there's a lot of vacant units. There's not as many people in Detroit as there used to be. Um, but you know, talk about a community that has capacity. The, I've looked at studies. There are a lot of communities that have lost population like that that have huge capacity right now that we could and should figure out how to help. And uh, there's things in the private market that you could actually work with the city if they you know, sell the home for a dollar to people that agree to invest and live in it. Um, and then maybe we can come up with some federal program to work those. And then you could maybe see in migration back to some of those uh, cities that have lost a ton of population, especially in the Northeast and the Midwest. Max, so, I really appreciate that question. Great question. I would just simply say as we close here, and you know, I'm, I'm the interviewer here, but one of, one of the uh, uh, areas that, that we should have looked at after the 0809 financial crisis was that if you had had banks or financial holders of that debt be able to write that debt down to the real value of the collapsed value of that mm -hmm. house and leave families in their homes, but allow them 30 years to write that off theoretically. Take it, you know, write it down in real time here, but figure out a way to get these people to stay in their homes. It was a doable thing. And, and I just really regret it, didn't it? We, so the blight problem became vastly worse. So uh, thank you so much, Congressman Steve Stivers, Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, uh, co-chairs of the Pup Congressional Public Housing Council. Thank you both Good so much here. for joining us thank today. You, Steve, Steve, thank you very much. Job, Great. Thank you, Congressman, for joining us this morning. It was great to have you. Uh, to learn a little bit more about the administration's efforts to address the racial inequalities that exist throughout the home buying process, the Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack, has sat down with the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Dr. Ben Carson. So please direct your attention to the video screens for key takeaways from our interview with Secretary Car Carson. Dr. Carson, racial inequalities in the home buying process, how big of a problem is it and what is HUD doing about it? Well, you know, there are certain regions of the country where there are an enormous restrictions, uh, zoning restrictions, uh, all kinds of regulatory problems. Those are the places where the prices are the highest. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at a place like uh, Los Angeles, 70 to 80 percent of the land is zoned for single family housing. Uh, and you throw on top of that all the regulatory things, including most recently solar panels, <laughs> you know, it becomes incredibly expensive. We've got uh, you know, 37 million uh, American households uh, who, you know, have some cost burden. Mm -hmm. They have to spend more than 30 percent of their income on housing. And uh, 18 million households that are severely cost burdened, spending more than 50 percent. We're not producing housing nearly as fast as we're producing families. Mm -hmm. uh, so for every 10 families that are uh, being produced, we're able to produce about seven uh, housing units. So uh, it's a growing problem. As far as regulations or legislation, what are you doing as far as just the basic making housing more affordable? How can Congress help you? Uh, there's been a lot of gridlock uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, but what can be done in the next two to four to ten years? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the things that are driving the cost are not national things. They're not federal things. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, the 80 plus percent of the cost is done at the state and local level. So that's why we're working with the states. That's why we're uh, giving preference points for grants to those who are actually tackling these things, incentivizing them. That's the way we do it. Deregulation has been very important to this administration. You focused on it. How is, specifically, how has deregulation at HUD helped minorities uh, get more affordable housing? Now, the reason that people are segregated in housing is not because, you know, there's a George Wallace standing at the door. Mm -hmm. It's because they can't afford to move to other areas. Uh -huh. So what I've decided that we should do instead is focus on how do we break that problem up. And the way that we obviously do that is make it possible to build more affordable housing. 
and to make it possible for people who have vouchers to be able to move to other areas. So, you know, we started a national task force uh, to work with landlords to find out why they weren't accepting vouchers and then rectifying the situation. That's, again, I, and it maybe it comes from my medical background, but I'd like to go to the source of the problem rather than treating the symptoms. Some have criticized HUD for proposing to eliminate a federal fund now used to repair public housing. Um, what is the role you, I've, I've seen you quoted as saying you want to have the, the private industry more involved? Yeah, public-private partnerships are really the answer there. Uh, for, for years and years, we just kept throwing more and more money after these capital expenditures and not making any progress. Where we have made progress is through something like the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. It's a public-private partnership. And in this situation, the private sector uh, now takes partial responsibility uh, for the building and partial ownership, but it remains in, uh, you know, PBRA so that uh, the units remain affordable mm -hmm. and, and that's really the key and this extends over decades and yet you have a private sector partner who's interested in the maintenance of that uh, structure. One of the other big things is the opportunity zones. Right, uh, in, in the tax law. Yeah, uh, that was part of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act and allows people to take unrealized capital gains, invest them into these 8,761 opportunity zones around the country. And, um, and does that help minorities specifically? It, it does because um, if you build up the infrastructure in their area and you build up the businesses in their area and you build more affordable housing in their area and at the same time fix Section 3, which we have are in the process of doing right now, which says if you're getting HUD funding, uh, you have an obligation to hire, train, or give contracts to the low-income people in that area. Even though it's been on the books for 50 years, people haven't used it because it's been too complex and encumbered by bureaucracy. We're fixing it so that that's not the case and incentivizing people to use it, which means that people will now be able to gain skills which will allow them to be independent and they won't be reluctant to do it because we're also in the process of trying to remove the um, things that the barriers that kept people from wanting to climb the ladder. Thank you to Secretary Carson for taking the time to sit down with us. And now um, is the time of the portion of the program that is produced by our sponsor, Wells Fargo. So please join me in welcoming on stage Michael DeVito, Executive Vice President and Head of Home Lending with Wells Fargo. Joining Michael on stage is Gary Acosta, co-founder and CEO of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Michael and Gary, the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks, Brittany, for the introduction. We're grateful for that. Uh, we're here today because we firmly believe in the value of home ownership. We see it as foundational to helping communities and helping families build wealth and grow, uh, grow the country overall. Um, home ownership's a central part of the American story. It's, uh, it's been a central part of my family. I think it's probably been true for Gary as well and, and for many of you. And we know that we can advance these challenges and advance solutions by working together. And so uh, this was an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the partnerships that we think are foundational to doing this. At Wells Fargo, we're focused on sustainable home ownership, uh, helping people not only achieve it, but sustain it over time. And, uh, and we think that's really critical, both in terms of the lending products we offer but also in the work of our foundation. And we just recently announced uh, a, a commitment to uh, put 2% of our profits into our foundation uh, over time and a billion dollars to address f housing affordability over the next six years, uh, including some challenge grants for uh, opportunities where we see new innovation coming in the form of uh, whether it's education or construction or ways to address some of the problems. So uh, I'm really pleased to invite Gary Acosta, 
who is the co-founder and CEO of the National Association of Hispanic Realtors. And so thanks for being here. It's good to be thanks here. Thanks for joining us. And let's just start by um, your membership is involved in working with families every single day yep. in communities around the country, helping them become homeowners. What are you hearing from your members and what's happening in the marketplace today? Well, first of all, Michael, uh, congratulations on the commitment and thank you for the invitation. Um, our members are real estate agents, brokers, uh, loan originators who are out there at the point of sale. And I can say with um, complete confidence, there's a lot of enthusiasm out there. Yeah. Uh, things have actually been well. As you may know, um, the Hispanic home ownership rate has increased for four consecutive years. So a lot of transactions out there. Agents are doing well financially. Um, and consumers, I would say, are probably as enthusiastic about home ownership as they have been historically. Um, I don't want to sound too Pollyannic right. because there are challenges out there that we want to talk about and right, address. Of course. But things fundamentally have been very positive. So you've seen this growth in home ownership in the Hispanic community. Is there a end in that in sight? Do you see? Is there any sense that maybe the appetite may start to wane? Or what's your view about uh, how, how you see the appetite for homeownership? Well, in I mean, this that's community? a great question. Um, I, I would say that uh, I don't see an end to the appetite. Uh, the desire for homeownership is, is hardwired in the Hispanic DNA, as we mm. like to say, because the family is really central to the Hispanic uh, experience. Um, there's, quite, there's definitely challenges out there, and we're talking a lot about the supply issues, and people are feeling that, right? I talk to realtors all the time that say they have five qualified buyers to every one property that comes out in the market. So that actually you know, can create challenges, and some people sure. can lose uh, you know, the belief that they can actually achieve home ownership. But one of the things that's really important to note about the Hispanic community in particular is its youth. Right. right, and even though there's a substantial gap between the Hispanic home ownership rate and the overall home ownership rate, that gap is closing because Hispanics are really aging into those prime home buying years right now, as I think you know. Yeah, no, I think that's right. You uh, you recently released your study on uh, Hispanic wealth report, and shares with us some of the insights in that report and what you're observing about the Hispanic community and what's growing in their wealth and the way they're approaching home ownership and other things. Yeah, so, um, you know, back in 2012, as we were sort of, you know, at the tail end of the crisis, I had a conversation with uh, Henry Cisneros, I think you know Henry yes. as well, former HUD secretary, and a study had just come out that showed that Hispanics may have lost up to two thirds of their actual uh, median household wealth during that four year span, which is obviously devastating. So it really kind of shifted our thinking at NARF um, around that home ownership is more of a means to an end. Mm -hmm. And clearly it is a driver of wealth uh, for the Latino community as well as just the general population out there. Right. So it helped us launch something that we call the Hispanic Wealth Project uh, with a goal to triple Hispanic wealth over a 10 year span. You guys have been a great partner in that regard uh, with a commitment of $125 billion in terms of mortgages because home ownership is a cornerstone of that effort. Uh, there's a focus on entrepreneurship as well as savings and investment. Right. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of data really tracking wealth uh, amongst the Hispanic community in general. Uh, so we wanted to start to report on that and track that and help sort of, I think, identify issues that the community, that the industry, uh, that government can start to recognize as being an issue. We've learned that um, home ownership is as important as we thought it was, right. you know, when we first uh, started this process. Uh, but savings and investment, entrepreneurship, as you know, Hispanics are creating new businesses at a faster rate than the general population as well. Um, so it's been a really terrific experience uh, to really start to understand the context that home ownership plays in the overall quality of life for Hispanics and, and the country in general. Yeah, I mean, there's some, some feedback that the Hispanic community is serving as an engine of the economy at the moment. What's your sense of that and what are the risks to that? Where do you think the challenges are there? So it's interesting, um, Steve Forbes, uh, Forbes magazine, uh, definitely not necessarily a guy that has been accused of being, you know, too, um, you know, focused on minority communities historically, uh, a real capitalist in general, yeah. recently tagged the Hispanic community as being the Calvary 
that's coming over the hill that is going to save our economy and continue growth um, and the well-being of the U.S. economy. Uh, so that was actually an interesting sort of dynamic. Um, you know, I, it, it really prompts me to kind of identify something that I think is important, and that is this is not a niche anymore, no. right, that we're talking about. Minority markets, Hispanic markets in particular, um, you know, when most people kind of think about that, when you see forums like this, they think about it in terms of, you know, this is a, a philanthropic effort that we should be focused on. Uh, this is a compliance issue for financial institutions. Yeah. Um, you know, I support things like affordable housing goals, CRA, and so forth. I think it's an important piece of it. But you guys in particular, being a leader, have really helped the industry understand that this is a growth opportunity. This is core to your business. Um, and when people view it, when institutions view it as um, a growth and profit opportunity, then there's more investment that really starts to happen there. And that's a tipping point that you know, we want to see continue moving forward. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I think for us, we see it as this is a core constituency. These are core consumers, yep. members of our customer base who we want to serve, right? And I think that uh, together we're finding ways to do we, that. We call it the new mainstream. Yeah, I, th I think <laughs> that's, that, that may be a fair way to describe it. Um, so to that point, what what can institutions like ours and like others like us, what do you think we need to do differently to help advance the solutions here? Well, I mean, there's several things. I mean, if I had uh, a magic wand and I could pick only one, I would say the best thing that you could do is do your best to diversify your workforce from top to bottom. Um, there are nuances in serving these communities, uh, the Hispanic community in particular, Having people inside your organization in managerial roles, the board level, and at the point of sale who understand those nuances, who come from those communities, is probably the one thing that financial institutions can do to really change that power paradigm for them. It makes a difference. Yes. It, it makes a difference. The conversations around the table are different. The thinking is different. So that's great. Uh, we are almost right on the number here. So I want to just thank the Hill for the opportunity to participate in this event. Thank Gary for his partnership and uh, engagement. And so thanks very much for it's been the time. It's a pleasure. Thank it's, you very uh, much. It's great to be together. Great to be here. So, thank, you thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Michael and Gary, for your compelling insight and your time today. We're making a few set changes, so bear with us a second. Um, but we have a great panel coming up here. So for more difficulties faced by American, African Americans and Latinos in their journey to own a home and what can be done to address these changes, we're now turning over to a panel of experts. So please join me in welcoming on stage Andre Perry, a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institute. Mr. Perry's research focuses on race, structural inequality, and economic inclusion. We will also be joined by Walda Yon, Chief Housing Officer at the Latino Economic Development Center. Ms. Yon brings over a decade of experience working with the Latino community on home ownership counseling and affordable housing prevention, today, today's discussion. Also joining us is Anton Thompson, Executive Director of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, the largest organization of African American real estate professionals in the United States. Mr. Thompson has focused his career on championing fair housing and community reinvestment by local and national financial institutions. And lastly, Jim Tobin, Executive Vice President of the National Association of Home Builders. Moderating today's panel discussion is Raphael Bernal, a staff writer with The Hill. Raphael, take it away. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank, you, uh, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Uh, should be a fun conversation. Um, let's let's sort of start from the uh, from the ground floor. Um, and um, Andre, start with you. What what are the biggest obstacles for you know minority first time home buyers? Mm. They make the choice. They say you know it's time. And then what happens? Well, I, I would say the first barrier is the. Um, sort of, of lack of investment on the federal government's part. 
to invest in black people, black and Latino people. Remember that the home ownership boom after war, the Second World War especially occurred because of federal infusion of cash into um, potential home buyers. And that from that moment on, you saw a rise of white homeowners and wealth builders um, that, that, still, that still endorse today. There's no reason to think why we can't have more home buyers from black and brown communities if we provide that infusion of, or boost from the federal government. We're, we, we constantly talk about giving people training and um, running them through programs, and all those things are needed. But you won't see growth unless you have a significant infusion of federal of revenue into home buyers that have been divested in um, from federal policy. Now, wh where, where would you put that infusion? Who, who, would, who would get that money? Well, I, you know, in my work, we look at, I, I, I did a, rec a recent research project and, um, that looked at the, the devaluation of housing assets in black communities. We um, controlled for education, crime, um, walkability, and all those fancy Zillow um, metrics. <laughs> And what we found, that in black communities, homes are worth 23% less than in, in, in white communities. And, and that equates to about 48,000 per home, about 156 billion in lost equity. And so in black communities, we know that in those geographic areas where black people live, we need to find ways via tax credit, or uh, via direct, um, a, 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 some type of loan program, to, because folks in those communities are, are also largely renters. There's a lot of people struggling to get in the home buying market. We, we're trying to do workarounds because of our, our, our constitutional um, um, pr prohibitions to, to give to black people and brown people. But we know where they are. And we have got to find geogra uh, geographically a find a way to infuse cash in those areas. Now, Waldo, with, with the current, with what we have right now, like before getting, supposing we would get that money, before getting that, when, when, a, when a black or Latino home buyer says, okay, I'm not going to go straight to the bank because I'm afraid of going to the bank or, or I, I don't have a credit card or all these reasons, and they go in an institution like yours. What is, what, is, uh, what is the fear that you hear most? What do you, what do you hear that, that they don't know what to, how to do? Their biggest obstacle. Yeah, well, we see every day when we are meeting with, uh, with our clients that um, they have a lot of fears and a lot of um, miscommunication from the financial, uh, formal financial system. And they don't know how the process works. They don't have the, um, enough education in the home buying process. So they don't know what is the first step. They don't know um, if they can receive assistance for the down payment um, or closing costs, or if there are programs that can, can help them. So one of the biggest uh, challenges and obstacles is lack of information and education for the community, for the Latino and, and minority communities um, to empower them so they can take an informed decision um, and they can use all the resources that are available in their area. And how quickly, from, from the moment they walk in, so suppose, supposing somebody who, who's in, in the possibility of buying a home, they walk in, they have no idea how to do it, which, by the way, it is a mystery. I don't, like, even renting is sometimes a mystery <laughs> to, to anyone. Um, from that moment they walk in, how long does it take you to, to, to take them from the, from the moment where they're, I don't know, to the moment where they're like, oh, I can sign that paper, I can get that home? Um, well, first of all, I can give you an appointment so you can come and learn about the home <laughs> process, please. Um, uh, it's free. Um, so, um, and everything is uh, depending on their individual situation. Um, if there is a person, a Latino person that they don't have established um, credit history, 
if they have been, been in the country less than two years, or they've been here for 10 or 15 years. Um, they have credit, but they have some things that they need to work with. Uh, so it's based on their individual situation, but I will say on an average of two to three years to prepare them to get to the point that they are mortgage ready and that they have enough savings, that they have created an emergency fund, um, and they have applied for any down payment assistance that exists in, in, in their area. So uh, Antoine, from, from the process side, what, what can be done to increase transparency, to, to make that, that time shorter, to make it easier? Well, there, there are a number of things. I think education is definitely an issue, promoting uh, housing counseling, uh, making more awareness about it. If you come from a community, uh, uh, I'm originally from Buffalo, the black ownership rate is 27%. So, you know, seven out of 10 people you come in contact with are now homeowners. That's a tremendous barrier in terms of the knowledge gap that exists. And, in, and if you come from a community where uh, the perception is that when you sit in front of a white loan officer, they're, they're, they're gonna assume that you're not ready. So that process um, can be very intimidating, it can be overwhelming, and so we've gotta do more to educate people. We've gotta make home ownership a, a high priority for local, state, and federal uh, elected officials and public policy makers, and reducing the time that it takes to, uh, to get through the home buying process, particularly for those people who are seeking a FHA or a conventional mortgage. That process can be long, it can be intimidating, and again, if you come from a community that's been historically discriminated against, it can be uh, very uh, an overwhelming process. You, you bring up the issue that is very often the elephant in the room, and so we, we can talk about the, the structural <clears throat> misgivings all we want, but, and this is, this is an open question uh, um, for whoever wants to tackle it, can we measure to what extent structural issues are, are driving home ownership down and to Absolutely. what extent bias is. Absolutely. Uh, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, we're the oldest African-American real estate association in the country. We put out a report every year called the State of Housing in Black America. We're working on our 2019 report. We analyze uh, the loan approval and denial rates in America based on the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, and we document uh, how these policies, whether it's loan level price adjustments, which, is, which did not exist before the crisis, where they uh, add additional points and fees on loans that disproportionately impact African Americans. We document that every year. So we're not just in the emotionalism. We look at how these policies and lack of good policies, outdated credit score models that are, are old as flip phones uh, that are still used uh, to uh, uh, provide access to mortgages. We document these every single year. So is there a number, there's, there's a statistic that in, in research for this like, surprised me. Out of the 100 cities with the largest black population, only three cities have a home ownership gap of less than 20%. Yes. Is, is, there, is there a number that you guys use to, uh, in your organization to, to illustrate this issue as, as strongly as that number? Yeah, I mean, I think we look at, um, whether you look at the population based on our demographics, whether well, you look at the fact that in most cities across America, every time a black person applies for a loan and a white person applies for a loan, African Americans are denied on typically one and a half to two times the rate of whites. And when we talk about setting that benchmark, you can be in a majority black city like Baltimore and the home ownership rate is lower, Buffalo, and you can have black mayors, et cetera. So we need to really, the numbers tell a lot and the policies are uh, really are not in sync with the population. So you have lenders that are not doing enough. You have uh, a HUD program that needs to be more aggressive in promoting home ownership. Right. I mean, I think, you know, yeah. I don't know the last time that HUD has really got become more aggressive in promoting home ownerships since like they had the home ownership zone in the 90s. So I, I just very quickly, not only in lending is there um, bias, but we have sh know from the research that from appraisals, there's um, bias in, in, in appraisals. There's bias in um, real estate agent behavior yes. as well. We're still um, directing black people to some communities and not others. 
And, and but we also have to remember that home ownership does not occur in a bubble, in, a, in isolation. Um, discrimination in employment impacts your ability to produce the revenue to, to ultimately buy a home. And we know that folks, um, um, black and brown people who um, call for um, a job out for a job are less likely to get callbacks. Um, and so all of these things sort of contribute to a lack of ability to buy a home. Uh, Jim, let me, let me bring you in with this. Um, to what extent do you, do you believe housing availability? We, we heard in the previous interviews, uh, there's very different conditions in it's Detroit and San Francisco for instance, or Cleveland was brought up. They're very different situations. To what extent is, is availability also becoming an issue? Well, I think supply is across the board, whether it's <clears throat> San Francisco, New York, and rural parts of America. Uh, housing supply is really what's driving the affordability problem that we have today. We're simply not building enough homes. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen the, the cost of, <clears throat> of regulation on a home, whether it's single family, it's, it's just over 25% of the cost of the home is is directly attributable to regulation at the federal, state, and local level. For an apartment, it's over 33%. Um, same thing, regulatory issues. Um, what can we do on the federal level? Something we're always working on uh, at NAHB, but we really think that it's, it's a local level issue. It's, it's trying to change these policies about where you can build, um, <clears throat> what you can build, uh, making sure that when we talk about home ownership, or, and we have to also talk about Rental too, right? That that's yeah. part of the entire housing pipeline. For as I think uh, Congressman Cleaver said, some people, I guess it was his cousin particularly, uh, <laughs> shouldn't be allowed to own a house or even given a house. So so for us, it's about making sure that pipeline works, whether it's uh, rental and even at the at the affordable end, market rate, and then all the way through single family buyers. It's it's all about putting more product into the marketplace and driving prices down. Do you do you feel there's a um particular geographical location, a city or state that has done a good job as opposed to what, where, where do the contrasts lie? Because I mean, I, I think my example of Detroit versus San Francisco is a little bit uh, too on the nose. Well, I, I think you know, San Francisco seems to be the poster child for everything that's wrong with housing right now. Um, and so no offense to anybody from San Francisco, uh, but you know, uh, South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina in particular, had, has done some really good things over the last couple of years uh, to, to, to clean out that regulatory underbrush, to, to put more types of housing on, uh, in the market. Uh, and, and also, they're attracting jobs in South Carolina. I mean, that's the other thing. You know, we, I, I heard the, the previous panel about you know, dropping you know, large, in, large employers into an area that's not prepared to house those employees. So if you want to attract businesses and if you want to attract capital, you're going to need to show that you've got the housing, the housing that can support thousands of new people moving into a community, and and, and not only just housing, affordable housing for their, their employees. Um, unpacking that, one of the things you brought up was uh, rental. Um, uh, Andre, do you do you believe, or or have you seen that the same uh, the same inequities of bias apply to the rental market as they do to the Purchase market, or is it different? Oh, absolutely. Um, and just to, to go back, single-family home zoning is um, w was a direct response to keep black people out of certain communities. And so we, have, so when you're looking for proposals, look to Minneapolis, St. Paul, where they're creating a a, a new zoning model that is more inclusive um, than your single-family um, home model. But also, you you see the same biases when. Folks are looking to uh, um, get a, um, an apartment, and so when folks are applying, um, and we have lots of data to support this, that um, when folks apply um, over the phone, they're they're getting interest. When they show up, um, they uh, somehow uh, along the way their application is denied. Um, but what is clear is that we need affordable homes. Period. The the idea that homes are going to be a wealth builder. That is, is going away some in particular areas. But um, we need in every community, um, and, I, and I prescribe to that notion that housing is a fundamental right, that people have a right to live in places. And you see this, being, this right being played out in places like DC, where b former black residents who were discriminated against have a hard time um, buying into 
um, the city that they've been in for a long time, and now they're being pushed out systemically um, in, in areas where that are farther away from jobs, from the job hubs, farther away from the educational centers. And so we need to figure out new ways to have affordable homes, particularly in your cities um, where there's um, um, intense racial um, um, in, um, integration of some sort or diversity. And we need to figure out ways to include um, economic diversity and solidify homes in those places. I'm going to I'm going to put pump the I'm going to pump the brakes before yeah. we, we're going to get into. Uh, I, I assume you're, you're about into gentrification and mixed housing because I mean that that is the next thing that comes up. But you mentioned one thing. I, I want to ask you all the real quick. Um, Latinos lost more equity in mm. 2008 than any other group, followed closely by, by African Americans. So I, I think that that is a shared experience among the two communities. Um, did they lose trust? Did, did the people who walk into your office lose trust in home ownership as a means of wealth creation? Yes, uh, definitely. They, um, they, the Latino community was the, I would say, the biggest community that took this hit impact for um, all the foreclosures happening in, I can speak for the area in uh, Prince George County, um, Manassas uh, in Virginia, Goodrich in Virginia. So um, this, uh, in, that, in that time, is, it was the, when we saw more Latino families buying houses in the area, the, the percentage of homeownership among the Latino community was high, really high in that moment. And um, right now, uh, the housing counseling agencies, we are having a lot of troubles creating that trust again in the community because um, we have uh, still have some generations that have been here for 20 or 30 years that they are established, they have uh, a stable income, they have established their credit history, but they don't trust that they are going to be doing a good decision. That how about if they buy a house today and then in three months we are going to have another financial crisis. So definitely the trust in that investment, in that wealth creation uh, tool um, among the Latino community is, is very low at this moment. If I could, I just want uh, uh, we do have to change the narrative about the importance of, of home ownership. Uh, we don't market home ownership enough to black communities uh, since the founding of America and post-slavery. African Americans have been trying to become homeowners. Uh, right at, I was with 40 acres in the mule. Black, the government understood that black people should own land. But we've always been in this situation of trying to get the land and then land being hustled away from us, either through sharecropping through outright non-lending to uh, black communities, whether it's redlining or predatory loans. And so, yes, we've got to shift the narrative. We've got to make sure that internally and externally, inside the community and outside, that we talk about this dream of home ownership that strengthens families, that improves health outcomes, educational outcomes, and the fact that many of our over 40% of small business owners start in the home. So we've got to tell that story more about the socioeconomic benefits of home ownership that African Americans have been pretty much shut out through most of our experience post-slavery. Now, let, let's get into, um, well, into gentrification. I, I, I had a, an, an interesting experience. I don't, I don't know if anybody else noticed, uh, but there were two members of Congress from New York, uh, the very well-known these days, AOC and, and Peter King. And they, they have a very different experience of gentrification. Peter King was talking about American cities, and they were specifically talking about New York before the process of gentrification. The um, you know uh, New York City in receivership, and and sort of uh, sort of that dangerous vision of New York. And he saw it as a positive. You know, it, it had gone from a very unsuccessful city to what he sees as a very successful city. And she, from her generational aspect. She's looking at it, all my neighbors got kicked out of their houses. And in a way, they're both right. I, because they're both pointing at, at specific. Now, is there a midpoint here? 
Does anybody want to pick that one up? Yeah, see, <laughs> I think part of the thing is, I used to chair the Community Development Committee when I was on the city council in Buffalo. And I, I can remember having these aggressive fights in the early 2000s about the fact that we have, we would invest, uh, we would bond, a lot of cities still do this bond, millions of dollars every year to demolish houses, right? Mm -hmm. But then they spend very, you know, maybe half a million to $1 million uh, rehabbing houses. And then you in these same neighborhoods, when African Americans live there, they can't get um, homeowners insurance. They, it's very difficult to get a, mm -hmm. a, a loan to rehab your house. But meanwhile, when whites come in, they're able to get that mortgage. They're able to get that acquisition loan to fix up their house. And then sometimes the city provides these incentives to try to get different mixed income people into these areas. And so we, 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 we look at economic stimulation, right, uh, mm -hmm. to attract others uh, to come in. But when the folks that live there, we're not as creative nor robust in making sure that the policies and the resources get to those communities, whether it's police protection, housing rehab, uh, parks and playgrounds, arts and cultural facilities, and small business services get there in an abundant way when black and brown people live in there. No. That's, and, and then and you put on top of that, the loan disparities for small business and home ownership, that's your gentrification. Is, is there an American city that has gotten gentrification <laughs> right? No, I, but I want to be clear, gentrification is a bad thing. <laughs> that that um, you hear this all the time, that um, the only thing worse than gentrification is no gentrification. I mean, that verbal waffle is crazy. I mean, it, it, no, when you invest in everyone equitably, mm -hmm. you don't have um, gentrification. You don't have people being priced out. Ca mm -hmm. uh, no, a category of people being priced out. Um, so, yes, home ownership. When you have the ability to home uh, own a home, you reap the benefits of economic growth. When you have the ability to own a business, you're not gentrified. You're welcoming people coming in. It's when folks aren't, um, don't have, a, or have a lesser ability to own a home, have a lesser ability to get the business loan. Um, that's where you see people being pushed out. But there is nothing wrong with um, people wanting more people to come into a city. However, there's every, it is absolutely horrible when you see black and brown people categorically pushed out of a community, not only, and poor people in the main. If you live in San Francisco, it is, you, you cannot be a teacher and live in San Francisco. If you live in parts of D.C., it is hard to just be a regular day-to-day -day nurse, um, teacher, pr or work in the institutions we, we're in. And so for, for me, we, we need to stop this, um, um, the, the discrimination that leads to people not uh, having the ability to establish place. Because if you don't have a home, it is very hard for you to, to be a citizen. Um, in the in this country, no, but before we before we skip through uh, uh, property taxes, uh, I, I would say skip through because we're going to be short on time at some point. Um, Jim, I, I noticed uh, in, in the in the interview uh, Bob Cusack had with uh, with the Secretary of HUD um, Ben Carson, uh, they, they tell the Secretary said, you know, public private partnerships. That's that's the way. That's what's going to solve it. He he seemed to he seemed to think that that was if not the magic bullet, I don't want to put words in his mouth, the key to, to resolving the housing issue. Is, is that how you see it from your perspective? Well, it's multifaceted. I mean, there's, there's, no, there, there's no one silver bullet, public-private partnerships aside. They're an important part of, 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 of what we do, but I believe it's market-driven. Uh, I believe it's, uh, we, were, we were talking earlier about uh, look, you know, cities that are trying to make sure that not everybody has the same opportunity. There's cities across this country that are putting design standards in place mm -hmm. to drive up the cost of housing specifically to keep those people out of their communities. And that's something uh, that we fight vehemently against. But we have to watch out for exactly that kind of, we talked about local regulations. That's, that's w one of the, the worst types of local regulations we need to fix. Um, we need to increase incomes. African Americans have the, of, of all the, the demographics from homeownership, African Americans have the lowest incomes. You need to 
you know, if you can if you can raise your income to afford a home, and then we drive the cost of affordability, I guess affordability up, not down. Right. Um, you're going to provide these op these opportunities, but it's it's across the board. It's it's going to take local regulations deciding that they want to attract more people and have an affordable housing product, whether it's through incentives, or, or cleaning up uh, the, the the regulations that that are driving up incentives. We need to raise. So we talked about wages. We need we need labor supply. We need to, we need to train more people to build the homes that we need in this country, uh, and those are really good paying jobs. I mean, it's it's across the board and you know across this city of all the of all the federal, the federal regulatory, they need to help solve this problem uh, from here by encouraging state and local governments to follow suit. And that's what I was getting at earlier, that we, it, it's imperative that we make this a public policy priority because of the social economic consequences of not doing so. I just want you to think about this, that um, last year Urban Institute put out a, a study that talked about that there's over one million, almost two million black millennials uh, across the country that make over $100,000 a year, and they're in about 10 markets, and this is one of them, and they're renting apartments. So it's not just income. Income is a barrier, but we have these black millennials, almost 2 million, that make over $100,000 a year that should be homeowners. So yes, we have some barriers, both real and perceived, but we also have to change the narrative as well, and that's why this fall will be really, our association will be really doubling down on trying to focus on black millennials. That's a, that's a great point. The demographics for home ownership in the country are only getting larger. Right? Yeah. We, and we're going to, if you think the problem's bad now on housing and housing affordability, and supply, it's only getting worse because Gen X uh, and the millennial generation, they're the most diverse two generations we've had in generations. Um, and, and so, and so, or ever, that's right. And, and so if we're going to solve that problem of, of creating a supply and opportunity, uh, for, for those two generations, they, they are the next big wave in o on ownership. Uh, we've got to solve that problem starting now, yeah, not, right. not waiting for the, those generations to crash on the, on the shore of, uh, of communities in the, next, in the next 10 years. Well, be, as we hear, uh, the next question is going to be on property taxes, so, so get, get that one ready. Um, <laughs> as we hear about that, uh, start getting your questions ready. We're in about two minutes, we're going to start taking questions from the audience, and we'd love to hear from uh, as many of you as possible. So. On, on property taxes, and I'm going to leave this one open again. Um, I, I've, I've lived in, in Chicago and, and Washington, D.C. since I moved to this country. Uh, property taxes are a gigantic part of gentrification in both those cases. They were used, well, they, were, they increased and they pushed people out. I don't get to say whether they were used that way or not. Do you believe they were purposely used that way? by cities gentrifying, where people pushed out with property taxes. I, I don't know about that because property taxes are also an issue in small municipalities um, where there was tremendous white flight. And so the Fergusons of the world, the Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania, the East Cleveland, they saw lots of people move out. They still have services they have to provide. Um, without, you know, the only way to make up for the loss of people is to increase property tax. You know, it's, we've got to find a way to generate revenue um, and to provide services for people. And one of the reasons why, when, in my dev housing devaluation report, one of the things that I wanted to point out where, where is in black communities, housing prices are so, are, are lower. You're robbing municipalities of that revenue. If, if housing prices are off, right. you take away money from, from policing, from schools, from infrastructure. Um, and so th um, this tax issue is, it, it, you know, it, it's all, you know, taxation is a, a big thing, but th there are so many issues involved in this that um, are connected to it. And I, and I generally believe that we got to deal with those um, connective tissues. So one, one thing I would um, talk about um, from my uh, state and, and legislative experience is that um, you often have a strange situation around the tax issue, especially for African Americans. So I, every, in many cities across, and towns across the country, you can challenge your assessment. And so one aspect yeah. is, Andre is talking about, you have the situation where African American properties are undervalued in terms of when they are appraised. And then you have another extreme where 
African-American properties are over-assessed right. because what yeah. they assess for and what they're appraised for are not one and the same. And so you have in some communities where African-Americans um, don't challenge their assessments enough, there's a lot of misinformation and education about, uh, about the, uh, the importance of uh, challenging your assessment, whereas a middle-class white area, they will, many of them that I represented when I was a state senator, they would challenge it every year, get attorneys, et cetera. So you do have some pushing out as a result of the increase of, of values. However, I just think we need to get, I think one of the solutions is, at least from our association, we do need more black appraisers. They're like almost a dinosaur like, uh, like uh, black architects. We need Unicorn. more black appraisers. Well, with, with that, I think uh, if there are any, any questions, I see, I see one right there, a uh, gentleman standing up, and we'll try to get to all of you. Hi, uh, Leon Peace in Washington, D.C. My question is, what opportunities do you see that the Opportunity Zones present yeah, to deal with this issue? I, I think that the Opportunity Zones have a lot of potential. I think they're bringing attention uh, to uh, local communities, particularly inner city areas. I think part of, though, we need to make sure uh, our state housing finance agencies uh, the local HUD offices, our city and county development people, and particularly a lot of those community stakeholders uh, at the local level are more engaged in that, and that this is not just a, 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 a commercial real estate transaction. Uh, the opportunity, the capital is coming in, and how do you create that multiplier effect to trans, uh, transform neighborhoods? The other thing that we need to look at is how do we make sure that as we do developments, how do we put African-American and Latino and other minority groups in condos and other things that can put them on the path of home ownership. Because home ownership does not always have to be single family rental. It could be co-ops. It can be a whole host of other things as we do these major apartment, uh, these uh, tall buildings and old uh, adaptive reuse projects in some of these urban centers. Let's be more creative but we've got to get more people paying attention to opportunity zones. Yeah, I would, I would agree on that, Leon. I think that uh, they're, they're, they hold great potential. I think we, as the regs are rolled out, I think one of the, one of the, the recent regs came out was, uh, there's a finite window that you have to, to, to work in the opportunity zone, but they've actually relaxed it, that if your project slows down because of local red tape, you're not gonna get penalized. So they're, they're, I think they're trying to make sure they maximize the, the potential here, and and you know my fear is they they expire you know and not too long ago. How do you how do you make sure that investors uh, and and developers in these areas have the certainty to keep these projects going? I mean th these they, they hold great as you said great potential, um, but we the, the proof's going to be in the pudding on these, and we got to get it right. But we also don't have enough black and brown fund managers or people mm -hmm. with their own opportunity funds, you know. I generally believe that when you invest in property and not people, you get gentrification. That too often um, we invest in um, these structures and it never leads to wealth building. So I'm more interested in opportunity zones in the potential of building wealth, but that requires direct investment in the developers who happen to be black and brown, in the projects that are managed by black and brown people, not just in areas where there are black and brown people. Let's and so that, that's, the, that's where I see the potential, but I also see the likelihood of things not rolling out the way it, we let's, would like. Let's package two questions. A uh, gentleman right here, and there's a lady back there. Uh, make them quick so we can try to get an answer for, uh, for both of them. Alejandro Becerra, National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Ed Pinto of the um, American Enterprise Institute has called for the expiration of the mortgage badge. Mm. He claims that the mortgage badge uh, is a major contributor of the current uh, high prices in, 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 in housing. Uh, he alleges that that works to the disadvantage of first time home buyers. Since the mortgage patch allows lenders to make uh, uh, loans for people with higher debt to income ratios of 43%, as long as they have compensating factors. Why do you agree or disagree with Mr. Pinto's efforts to uh, have the mortgage uh, uh, 
patch expire. Okay, we're gonna quickly package that with one more. I think there was one on the left side. Um, actually, you, you can start answering that. Yeah, I'll jump right into that. Um, so, well, number one, I disagree with many things that Mr. Pinto <laughs> says. Um, not everything, but many things. Uh, the mortgage patch, just like loan level price adjustments, uh, are things that um, we need to look at the mortgage patch in terms of seeing how we can continue to make sure that we get more African Americans and other minority groups into home ownership. We also need to deal with the issue of this loan level price adjustments, risk-based pricing that did not exist, uh, which is pricing African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans out of home ownership. Uh, that's a fixable problem. We don't need Congress to do that. That can be done through a regulatory process, through FHFA, which is the Federal Housing Finance Agency. And yes, we need to address the patch, but we also need to take care of about three or four other things part of housing finance reform. Uh, and 203K is another thing that he does not mm -hmm. talk about that we need to look at because that can help people in Cleveland, Baltimore, mm -hmm. Buffalo, uh, Kansas City, St. Louis, a number of cities to help people with acquisition rehab. We need to modernize the HUD 203K program too. And very, very quickly. Hi, Anna Tiger, Tax Foundation. I was curious as to whether you see the mortgage interest deduction as an asset to minority communities in home purchasing, especially yeah. given the recent expansion of the standard deduction. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think what we, what we knew was gonna happen after ta in tax reform and now after is that the, the mortgage interest deduction is now nothing more than a, a, a deduction for people at the high end of the economic spectrum mm -hmm. and people who have expensive homes. And so it is no longer that first time home buyer middle class deduction, or sorry, uh, incentive that it used to be. Uh, from NHB's perspective, we believe that it's time to look at a different way to incentivize. Housing has always been incentivized in this country, maybe at varying degrees, yeah, it's but it's always been part, part of the tax code for a reason because home ownership is good for the social fabric of America. It's time that we need to look at the mortgage interest deduction, whether it's really doing what it was supposed to do, and maybe look at a different incentive like a, a tax credit, maybe something that incorporates uh, property taxes because we've seen that same erosion uh, for, with the, with the, the, um, the salt cap at $10,000. Again, we have to help that first and second rung of home ownership, not the high end. So uh, from the NARAP perspective, we strongly support the uh, mortgage interest deduction. We do think it needs to be strengthened. We need to add additional incentives uh, to promote home ownership. Uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks is uh, introducing a bill for us called the American Dream Down Payment Savings Plan which would uh, mirror the uh, 529 that we, where people can save tax-free uh, for home ownership. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, that uh, Mr. Tobin talked about earlier is that, uh, and I want to expand upon this, America has always provided incentives to access land, whether it was through home grants, homestead grants in the you know, 17, 1800s to uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and, and, and uh, FHA in the 1930s and 1940s. And so we've got to be aggressive. If we want to level the playing field, it's got to, we've got to be intentional. One of the guys uh, uh, that from Wells Fargo, we were at a panel a couple weeks ago, and he said we've got to be intentional about increasing home ownership. And I think the federal government, the state, and local, uh, local governments must be intentional about increasing the rate of black home ownership. White homeownership would not be where it is today uh, over the last two, three hundred years of this, of this country without the intentional efforts of the federal government to help acquire land, develop land, and boost people up and prop people up to become homeowners. Well, I think, I mean, we're a bit over time, but uh, I think that's a good, good place to end this. Uh, please thank our panelists. <laughs> and have a great day. <laughs> Thank you to our panelists and all of our speakers for being here this morning. What a pleasure to hear uh, all of your insights and expertise, so thank you again. This brings us, unfortunately, to the end of our program this morning. On behalf of The Hill and our sponsor, Wells Fargo, thank you to everyone in the room and those that have joined us on live stream uh, for joining us this morning. If you missed any portion of today's conversation, uh, the full event video will be available on thehill.com shortly. 
We encourage everyone to keep the conversation going on social media using the hashtag, hashtag the Hill AFF housing. And as a reminder, please be sure to complete the electronic survey uh, that will be sent to you later today. Thank you for joining us this morning again and enjoy the rest of your day and National Home Ownership Month. Thank you.